Last night, I did a video on the big patch that just dropped, which was including the Armistice Bastion, the Warclaw Mount, lots of balance, and some other things. Well, shortly after that, the devs made another post talking about further changes to the game in their late notes. That's what I want to cover with you guys here, as well as some undocumented changes that the wiki guys have at least added with their wiki notes. Nothing too major, but in the spirit of being complete about things, I thought I'd roll through it. So first of all, there was a whole second update, update 2, which did a few described bug fixes. First involving a newly added NPC I mentioned. So the Warclaw Helmet, which is what you get from the, re the reward track. The Warclaw Helmet can now be acquired from LV, the Warclaw Tender, by players who completed the Warclaw Reward track prior to unlocking the Warclaw Companion Collection achievement. So if you just spammed that, war tr that reward track up really fast without spending your world points, you could kind of break things. And indeed, I almost did that, as I said, with my keys. Now, this NPC here, LV, the Warclaw Tender, this is kind of your iconic stable master named NPC associated with the mount, such as how we had, I guess, Gorik for the beetle, but like Unja for the Springer. They have a bit of dialogue, which I'll get to in my Warclaw Spotlight production. Next, we have a bug fix for Guardian, the symbol of punishment. Now, that's the Scepter 2. They say fix an issue that caused this skill to inflict more damage than intended. That obviously I underwent sweeping changes in recent ish history. It used to be all the individual packets, now it's an actual symbol and whatnot. I'm not sure whether that's a new thing or whether a long standing thing they're fixing. They say fix an issue that caused the two week version of the Mistlock Sanctuary Pass Key to sometimes transport players to the wrong map in certain instances. So only the two week version, which many of us don't use has this weird bug that was taken to the wrong place? Okay. And last of all, possibly a big change, quite specific to the new release and the new mount, uh, is this. to do, And I believe this had a big effect on World vs. World right when the release came out. Players no longer receive war score when using the War Claws Engage skill while the Bloodlust effect is active. So some of you will immediately from that note recognize what's going on, but to unpack this for the rest of you, obviously within World vs. World you have the Bloodlust mechanic for taking the shrines in the center of the Borderlands, and if you've been successful in this and granted your side the Bloodlust, yes you get attribute points from it, but also it means that when you finish someone, you actually earn world score for your side, allowing you to kind of supplement your efforts in World vs. World via territories by straight up deathmatching people. Now, the main thing with this though that counterbalances it is when you're in these massive zergs where potentially a lot of world score could be claimed, uh, there's a lot of cleave going on and it's pretty much impossible to just stand there casually, physically stomping out and executing stomp animations on everyone around. People are going to have to be cleaved down. You're going to be too vulnerable trying to go for those stomps. So that's kind of the balance that's at play. Then they add the new mount and the new mount with its disengaged can stomp people. So there's kind of a technique whereby now if you organize your zerg properly, and everyone was mounted like cavaliers, you can charge in and finish people off to actually reap huge rewards. And so I believe people cottoned on to this and something like this started happening yesterday, which sounds unbelievably cool and like a really awesome spectacle. But obviously you don't want one specific element of the game like this to usurp all the rest. And while it's cool right now, it'd eventually get very tired very quickly, I suppose. So the devs throw this uh, patch in to head that off. You can still do the big epic stomp outs on people, but you're not going to be claiming lots of war score at the same time. And so that's about it. Maybe people who have been in there can chip in. Queue times have been way too long for me. And so I've just spent most of my time in PvP checking out how the balance uh, changes have affected things there. Let's get into the late notes from yesterday. So these were other things that came into the game, but nobody really knew about until the devs came out and said them. So first of all, the Ellen Riverland Mazumba will no longer appear in areas it shouldn't. So this is a sand shark, like mini hidden boss. Basically, you kill a ton of stuff in an area, then this guy spawns, and you get an achievement for taking it out. Now, those who follow my second channel recently will know that I've been going through all the Ellen Riverlands achievements and making mini videos out of them. Mazumba did not appear as a production in that series, which means when I got this achievement, it was ages ago. I really don't remember it at all at this point. The bug sounds like it's something due to the nature of 
he only spawns when things die. So maybe when wherever the last thing dies determines where he spawns and it could end up on a cliff or something. But that's just my speculation. It's now been fixed. This next change is really interesting. I do have some footage for you guys of it as well. Increase the experience gained from completing Renown Hearts at level 2. So this really is weird to me. Obviously, the way the game works is this. You create a character and you're level 1 in the tutorial. Uh, and the tutorial is an area where you can never die. There's no real mechanics. You can literally just smash your face on the keyboard to defeat a supposedly epic boss. You get a cutscene and then you hit level 2, right? So really, in Guild Wars 2, there is no level 1. It's just like a quick experience you have right at the beginning of the game. Everything starts at level 2. And it's here that you're told, hey, maybe help people in the world. This is what a renowned heart is. It leads you to areas where dynamic events are. You do these for a bit until you're at level 10 and you move on, right? That's the idea. Uh, but it always pushes you to like that first renowned heart. Well, now they're saying that they've increased the experience from doing that first renowned heart. And I checked. It looks like it gives you a full level. So you kind of skip straight to level 3 in Guild Wars now to some extent. You beat the tutorial and you're level 2. You do one heart and the footage in the background you can see I'm just pressing F on a couple of trees in Caledon Forest. And you, it does look like you go straight up to level 3 from that. Uh, so that's fine, I guess. It's a really weird change to me on so many levels though because what does that matter? What does that affect with the game that you go to level 3? I guess it's so that one of the very early initial experiences players have is to realize hearts are meant to be rewarding more than points of interest more than vistas more than a lot of these other things that the content guide leads you to with seeming parity they want to instill in you an understanding that renowned hearts are really important and maybe that's fine maybe they're right to understand that those early experiences people have really stick with them and you know you can incentivize someone to do hearts for the rest of the game as long as that first one is really really rewarding but why and why now I wish I could get some developer commentary on what on earth is going on here. There are thousands of things you could change about the leveling experience that are just as small and simple to execute but would mean so much more. And this, accelerating level 2, is certainly nowhere near my list. I can only imagine that this was added for some flippant reason based on an anecdote offered to a dev by a friend or family member that now they're acting on. I, I just have no clue. Next, we have Lake Doric. They fix an issue that could cause a stall in the White Mantle Control N Nora's Homestead meta event. Good housekeeping and nice to see focus again on Season 3 maps as much as anything else. And finally, for World Polish, another big change. And this is the main one in yesterday's video. Several of you guys said, oh, WP never mentioned this because, you know, the information wasn't out yet. They say, Domain of Istan, the Defeat Warden Amala event will now spawn a total of five champions over its duration, regardless of its event scale. Now, what does this mean for those of you who haven't been continuously farming Istan all season? It means that farming Warden Amala in the Sunspear Great Hall is kind of gone now, to the extent we saw people were doing it before. The idea was you would spawn the boss, not really DPS it much, have lots of people there, and whenever ads spawn, you'd kill them for their champ boxes and all their good stuff. And yeah, now if there's only going to be five, then people won't be doing it so much. Some are very grumpy about this. It's not the first time we've seen a flavor of the month meta farm be directly given some kind of nerf. The devs may be doing it to make way for a new one at the end of the season with episode six coming up. It might be because they just want to spread everyone out through all the otherwise perfectly viable farms that were simply being overshadowed in the game. And I'm quite interested to see where exactly people end up going most there. Moving on from World Polish, we have a general section with two changes. One is that when changing equipped skills, the currently equipped one will now be highlighted in the selection list. The number of little changes over the years that have gone into selecting new skills to remove clunk and make it as easy as possible... As, it's so many now, but I really feel like the system's in a brilliant place. It would be hideous to go back and play launch Guild Wars 2 now and fiddle around with the swapping skills UI. Uh, so yeah, this is just another little cherry on top of all of that, and you guys can see what that looks like in the background. Next, you got fixed a bug in which completing adventures would occasionally cause crashes. crashes. Fair enough. Next, for items, there's a change to the Rune of the Cavalier. So this is one of the Path of Fire runes that means when you use your Mount Engage, it gives you quickness and a damage buff. Now, the 
rune tooltip text itself has never said how much that damage buff was. But for the game, it was actually 20% increased damage. That's a hell of a lot. That's like a grandmaster trait right there. Plus, obviously, uh, quickness. And it was kind of a fun, flavorful pick for open worlding while you're in the Path of Fire region stories as well, I guess, at the same time. Uh, so that's the Cavalier runes. Now we have mounts in World vs. World. Well, some of that's going to have to be addressed. They've nerfed the runes in World vs. World only to be just 5% instead. So it's kind of an obscure thing that it's an untooltip specified change only within one specific mode of the game. I do like the idea of... Cavalier runes being something cool to use in World vs. World, but maybe they were scared 20% was immediately way too high, and by putting it to 5, it might be at a sweet spot where some people run Cavalier with their Warclaw and others don't. I mean, my gut instinct is that this is way, way, way much of an over-nerf, but hey. Next, we've got Profession Skills. Speaking of nerfs and things, opening with Necromancer, and well, this is actually really interesting to me, the matrix of things going on. We're talking about Unholy Sanctuary, which is a death magic grand master. That means while you're in Shroud, you're regenerating health. And it also means if you die, instead of dying, you go back into Shroud for free, even if it was on cooldown, right? I really like the grand master, and I wish they had more of a place in various areas of the game. Uh, but so we're talking about Unholy Sanctuary, death magic grand master. And for this trait, they fixed a bug in which Desert Shroud, which is the Scourge's Shroud would not break stuns if the foot in the grave trait, now that's Grandmaster Soul Reaping, was also equipped. So yeah, if you augmented your shroud via these three distinct things, that specific elite specialization, plus being a death magic grandmaster for unholy sanctuary, plus being the soul reaping grandmaster for foot in the grave, all of this at once would break the stun break interaction. Kind of amazing. And I wonder if this really patch only came in now, because there's another shroud as well. You can now be harbinger shroud. So if I'm in an unholy sanctuary, harbinger shroud, foot in the grave, does it all also work? I'm going to assume yes, since it's all in this patch. But man, what a beautiful illustration of some cool necro buildcraft there. This is why I get so disappointed when people say that Guild Wars 2 has less complexity in its skill system than Guild Wars 1. They're just not realizing that traits are now the real playground, not weapon skills. Next, we've got Thief for Death's Retreat. This is kind of reiterating what we already knew. Death's Retreat fixed a bug that caused this skill to apply the damage increase from lead attacks incorrectly in PvP and World vs. World. So yeah, Boots and I talked about this on our skill balance review. The lead attacks trait was recently nerfed so that it should only work while you're in combat. But for Death's Retreat, it was working anyway, and now they fixed it. Then we have uh, Warrior Banners, and obviously these things had an overhaul. Well, another little thing for the overhaul, banners now follow the same rules as spirits and turrets, in that banners are now destroyed when the owner enters certain states, such as mounted, or defeated. Now, that's not down state, that's defeated, okay? So, I think they're just doing that to make sure everything is uniform, and particularly for banners, it's probably for the quality of life, but the fact that banners now disappear when you're defeated is kind of a nerf, I suppose. Uh, won't be lost on some people. The last of the late notes it was relating to the Black Lion Trading Company, which is that the Black Lion chest was updated to the Wartorn chest, and that there's the Earthbound package available. I could have sworn they talked about that uh, already initially, but I guess not. So that's it for the late notes there. I will add a couple of extra things onto the video though. First of all being wiki notes. Now sometimes these are really interesting. It's basically undocumented changes the community's found. Only one for this release, but it's this, that the background music in the Mistlock Sanctuary now starts with a random track on each visit, instead of, I guess, always being that Fractals tune, which is a shame because I love that Fractals tune. Wasn't it Timey's game they had playing there? I'll note that the Armistice Bastion had some nice music too, and I never mentioned that in my previous video. The other thing I'd like to say is, uh, because as I mentioned earlier I've been PvPing a lot under the new balance the most striking changes so far are definitely scrapper changes scrapper feels really really meaty now the fact that it's gyros can't be DPS has been very prominent for the bulwark gyro the cleanse gyro even the heal gyro and something I speculated at before in the balance review with boots has kind of come true it's to do with the sneak gyro so sneak gyro before the release was kind of perma stealth, but you could see the gyro itself. You could see see the gyro to have players move away from it accidentally and thus reveal themselves, or you could just blow the gyro up. That's not possible anymore. And so the elite has been reworked in that it's still massive stealth, 
uh, that is pulsing and you can move around. It's always focused on you, but it's not infinite. It does have a duration. It's just a very long duration. The other thing about the Elite is it's now a moving smoke field with you. And so what we were wondering before the release actually came out is... If you are fighting a scrapper hiding in a sneak gyro, do you at least see the field? Similarly to how before this patch, you would at least see the gyro. Well, you don't see the field. So it's just a really strong skill now. It's not infinite stealth. It does wear out, but it's very, very long. You compare this gyro elite now to something like classic Guild Wars 2's Mass Invis on the Mesmer, and they're just worlds apart. It's amazingly strong for securing resurrects or disengaging in PvP. For example, if you're trying to hold a node, you've been plussed very dangerously. You can just go into this gyro and stealth forever. You can do all kinds of crazy mind games with people. It's uh, kind of ludicrous. Some other elements of the patch were not as exciting as I was hoping. Harbinger Shroud is not as rewarding as I thought it was going to be. It's not much more Condi damage. It's not much pa uh, flat damage. So as far as using it on like a Power Scourge as I was hoping, I don't really see it as much of a thing. It's definitely more of a lateral movement and more of a reshuffle and address to world versus world on demand corrupts. Where now you get these really big visual markers and, you know, there's actual counterplay. So I do think it's a good change for the game, particularly on the world versus world side. But it's not really created new builds in the way that I was kind of hoping. And and for War Banner as well, yes, War Banner does now do damage on cast, but it's not high enough to have that really awesome team fight swing, execute, finishing move like I was hoping. It's only like a quarter of where I was hoping it would be. So again, that's not very interesting and definitely can't compete with Rampage in the way that uh, I was first hoping it would. Uh, so yeah, those are some of the main ones. Obviously, the big rework spirits I still haven't played with much. So maybe down in the comments, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on that. There you go, guys. That's the late notes. Hope you're enjoying and I'll see you for more videos very soon. Thanks for watching. Have a good evening, everyone.